Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halady. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week we check in again with Don Hancock, Executive Director of Southwest Information and Resource Center, on the recent restart of exhaust fans at the radiologically contaminated Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Then one from the vault. Nuclear Hot Seat number 7, back in July of 2011, had John Solomon, Vice President of Purchasing from Eden Foods, talking about what his company had already done to determine the safety of their foods imported from Japan, only four months after Fukushima began. The quote he reports from the FDA inspector is priceless. Some perspective on what was capable of being done that other food manufacturers and importers still have not put into place. Plus, numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, the John Stewart Twitter campaign, and more nuclear information than polite society would have you mentioning in its presence, all coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, October 21st, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Breaking news, Nuclear Regulatory Commission Chair Allison McFarlane has announced her decision to leave the NRC at the end of the year, four years ahead of schedule. McFarlane was nominated by President Obama to complete the last year of Dr. Gregory Yasko's term as chair, and after the Senate confirmed her, she took over as chair in July of 2012. Then in June of 2013, She was confirmed to a five-year term of her own, scheduled to end June 30, 2018. But instead, she has decided to take the post as Director of the Center for International Science and Technology Policy at George Washington University. McFarland said, I will continue to work on nuclear safety and security and for a better public dialogue on nuclear technology through my teaching and writing, as well as by training a new generation of specialists in this area. So Allison is leaving the nuclear wonderland. Can't wait to read the tell-all book that she's going to write, contracts for which I'm sure are being pitched for her even as I record this. You're getting out just in time, Allison, because the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has accepted the Department of Energy's design for an underground geologic nuclear waste repository at, drumroll, Yucca Mountain in Nevada. Pro-nukers are peeing their pants in glee because the NRC's Safety Evaluation Report, Volume 3, concluded that long-term storage of nuclear waste after the closure of the proposed Yucca Mountain repository site is both technically feasible and safe. No mention of the aquifer under Yucca Mountain that stands to be contaminated by radiation if the damn thing leaks, much like the WIP site has just leaked. Fortunately, we can always depend on NIRS, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, NIRS, to come up with a fact sheet on Yucca that completely counters the pro-nuclear propaganda. You can find it at nears.org slash factsheets slash yucca. And we will have a link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 174. More shenanigans from those pro-nuclear crack-ups. In an internal report uncovered by the investigative unit at nbcbayarea.com, Tetra Tech the contractor hired to do radiological cleanup of the Hunter's Point shipyard in San Francisco, says it provided the Navy false soil samples while working on the cleanup. They claimed areas of the shipyard were free of radiation when they may not have been. The Pasadena-based multinational engineering, construction, and environmental corporation won more than $300 million worth of contracts for the cleanup work at Hunter's Point. Isn't there a federal indictment in there somewhere? And two federal contractors developing a treatment plant for radioactive waste at the Hanford site in southeast Washington state have refused to hand over records related to the firing of a whistleblower who raised safety concerns. The nerve, how dare she! 
Department of Energy Inspector General Gregory Friedman said in a memorandum to Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz Moniz that Bechtel National and URS Energy Construction have withheld more than 4,500 documents that his office requested to determine whether URS employee Donna Bush was terminated in retaliation for her disclosures. The terms of the $11 billion contract requires both companies to produce all documents acquired or generated in connection with the project. But attorneys for the firms said the contract clauses were too broad and unenforceable. Government against corporations. Who do you think is going to win this one? Regarding the trial of four Cape Cod activists charged with trespassing onto the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station's property on Mother's Day, she's in, she's out, she's in, yes, Dr. Helen Caldicott will be allowed to testify on behalf of the four grandmothers who trespassed in order to protest nuclear and plant flowers. The four women, who range in age from 60 to 80 and call themselves the grandmothers, point out that their action came at the end of a Mother's Day rally intended to raise awareness of the dangers they say the plant poses to the public. Last Friday, Judge James Sullivan refused to allow Dr. Caldicott to testify. Instead, the judge told defense attorney Bruce Taub that he might allow Caldicott to testify on Wednesday, quote, if you bring in other witnesses that make her testimony relevant, and then refused to let Taub add any witnesses to the existing list. What happened? We spoke with one of the defendants, Diane Turco of Harwich, Massachusetts, about the events that just took place. Diane, how was it that Dr. Caldicott, who was first excluded from being allowed to testify, is now being allowed to testify in the court case? On Monday, Judge Sullivan heard Dr. Richard Clapp, an epidemiologist from Massachusetts, who was the head of the cancer registry and completed a study that determined with 90% significance that the closer one lived or worked near the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth, the closer one lived or worked there, um, there was a four times increase in leukemias. And that opened the door for Dr. Caldicott's testimony. So it was simply bringing in this other doctor to testify and give that information that allowed the door to be open. Right. I think the judge determined that Dr. Caldicott's information wasn't specific to Pilgrim, but she can testify on radiation and childhood cancers. Dr. Caldicott did clearly state that she has been, you know, she had uh, spoken in Plymouth before and she's spoken on Cape Cod about Pilgrim, so she did testify that she had information about Pilgrim and could testify to that, but I guess the judge determined that we needed additional documentation before she was allowed. So it's all good because she will be here tomorrow to testify. We'll bring you the trial results next week. And now, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, None Nuts of the Week. Did you know that the Trinity site in New Mexico, the location where we first tested the nuclear bomb, is open to the public one day a year as a tourist attraction? Whee! What fun! You get to go to this spot at the White Sands Missile Range to see the stumps of the vaporized tower that held the gadget, the first bomb. A mock-up of the casing of Fat Man, the bomb we dropped on Nagasaki. Lots of pro-military and pro-nuclear propaganda all over the place. And lots of trinitite. Pretty blue-green pebbles formed when the heat pulse from the explosion fused the desert sand into glass. Now, you are not allowed to take Trinitite from the site because it is still mildly radioactive. That's what they say. Kind of like being a little bit pregnant. But families come together, kids play in the dust, and I'll bet that at least a little Trinitite migrates from the site to show and tell, pants pockets, even made into jewelry. Give your girlfriend a radioactive necklace that can give her breast cancer, the gift that keeps on giving. So we fetishize the pain and destruction into a jolly little jaunt that can give the whole family cancer. What a blast. 
And that's why the idiots behind opening the Trinity site up as a tourist attraction is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. In Japan, post-typhoons, the word is not good from Fukushima Daiichi. Tokyo Electric Power Company, after first denying any reports of damage or abnormality, on October 15 admitted that there had been a sharp spike in the radioactivity of water samples taken near the number two reactor building. Levels of radioactive cesium and strontium-90 both had increased almost four times their previous highs. Nuclear genuine expert Arne Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education says there's a gamma ray haze over the plant. Gamma rays are like x-rays. There's essentially a haze of radioactive particles. Arne posted a full report on the phenomenon on his website fairwinds.org f a i r e winds.org and a report by the Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute, reveals that Fukushima's radioactive release is much larger than Chernobyl and could have emitted nearly four times as much cesium-137 as took place in Ukraine. We will have a link to the article and all the math as revealed on enenews.com on our website. Reporter Sam Harnett for PRI's The World did a great story on former NHK anchor June Horry, who spoke at a TEDx event in Kyoto, Japan. Horry, who was and is a trusted newscaster, was frustrated after Fukushima Daiichi in his inability to tell the true story on his news program. He says the network restricted what he and other journalists could say about Fukushima and moved more slowly than foreign media to report on the disaster and how far radiation was spreading. The attitude in the newsroom was not to question official information, and they did what was called announcement journalism, not reporting honestly and originally on the crisis, but only repeating press releases of big companies and the people in power. Hori was on the ground in Fukushima and says, A lot of people kept asking me, why didn't you tell us earlier about what is happening? So out of frustration, he started tweeting uncensored coverage. He says, I got a huge response, but then my superiors said the NHK was getting complaints from politicians about what I was saying. They told me I had to stop. Hori eventually quit the NHK and started his own website for citizen journalism. Eight Bit News. That's the number 8-BIT News. This is taken from a much longer article, and we will have a link up to the full text on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 174. And World Network for Saving Children from Radiation has posted their translation of a devastating message posted by a Mrs. Junko Honda. Mrs. Honda migrated from her native Kagamishi in Fukushima Prefecture to Sapporo, Hokkaido after 3-11-11. Although she was a successful beauty salon owner who ran two salons in Kagamishi, she closed down her businesses in 2012 and moved to Sapporo with her husband and two children, leaving everything behind. She took note of a number of unusual health problems that had happened to her family members, including her teenage daughter, as a serious warning for radiation effects on health. The resulting chronicle is a devastating list of illnesses, not only in her own family, but among her clients. We'll have the link up on our website. In London, the Freeze Art Fair opened on October 14 and launched the Japanese artist's United Brothers conceptual art presentation of soup made from daikon radish grown in Fukushima. This free soup was presented as performance art under the title, Does This Soup Taste Ambivalent? Ai Arakawa, one of the artists, flew his mother in to actually make the soup. And while he said he had tested the daikon radishes used to make it, he admitted that he had only had the test done twice. 
One of the isotopes, cesium-134, was not detectable, but cesium-137 tested at 5.4 becquerels per kilogram. So there is radiation in the soup. I said that he did not have answers to the questions of food safety, but saw it as his role as an artist to stimulate discussion on the topic. And that he did. As visitors to the fair approached the entrance, they were greeted by a number of activists, including a berobed Japanese Buddhist monk beating a traditional drum. The activists handed the art fair visitors two leaflets, one warning about the possible radioactivity of the soup and another providing more general information about the ongoing catastrophe at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Freeze co-founder Matthew Slotover recently admitted his uncertainty as to whether or not he'd be up for trying the soup. They don't look radioactive to me, and I like the look of it. I think if they're coming all the way from Japan to do this for us, I think it's only right that we also take part and sit down and enjoy some food with them. One visitor who tried the soup said, There was a little doubt, but then I thought it is at the Freeze Art Fair, so it has to be okay. It's an exchange of trust. Contemporary Art Society critic Robert Dingle enjoyed the soup so much on Wednesday, he went back for seconds the following day, saying, I trust Freeze when they tell me it is safe. I will keep you posted if I start to develop any extra limbs. Oh, yuck, yuck, yuck. A reporter for The Guardian said, This stuff is delicious. At the time of going to print, I am not yet dead. You're also no kind of a reporter to not have researched the impact of internal contamination from radiation before you went into this story. So is there a registry of the people who have eaten the soup? And can we look them up in 15 years to find out the condition of their health? Now that would be a really interesting art installation. In France... Arriva Nuclear Chief Executive Luc Orcel resigns, citing health reasons, saying he had no choice but to take a leave of absence in order to pursue treatment. No announcement of what was wrong with him, but when someone pursues treatment, the implication is cancer, which is something caused by the byproducts of the nuclear industry. As ye sow, so shall ye reap, or just Irony. In Britain, it has now been proven that many servicemen ordered to watch bomb tests during the Cold War passed on the effects of deadly radiation to their children. Research, which shows that their offspring have ten times the normal rate of birth defects, has finally been accepted by the scientific community. The study proves that wives have three times the rate of miscarriage. Children are five times more likely to die as infants. Babies are three times more likely to be stillborn. Veterans' grandchildren are eight times more likely to have birth defects. Grandchildren of veterans twice as likely to get childhood cancer. And most shocking of all, the problems are likely to last at least 500 years or 20 generations, should they even be able to be born. And in Canada, nuclear safety regulators now mandate that local health and emergency management agencies stockpile potassium iodide pills at strategic locations within 50 to 80 kilometers, 31 to 50 miles, around each nuclear reactor so that they can be distributed rapidly if needed in case of an emergency. This from the country that's trying to convince us that it's perfectly safe to put a nuclear waste repository within one mile of the shores of Lake Huron. I'm wondering if they're planning to supply potassium iodide pills to those people who live within 50 miles of the shores of any of the Great Lakes. And remember that potassium iodide only takes care of exposure to radioactive iodine-131. It does nothing to remediate against cesium, strontium, plutonium, americium, or any other radionuclide that might get released. We'll have this week's featured interviews in just a moment, but first, if you're looking for something scary for Halloween, I suggest Yes, I Glow in the Dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's my ebook about what it means to find yourself only one mile away from a nuclear meltdown as it is happening. It's filled with unexpected twists, turns, and horrors, not all of them nuclear. By purchasing it, 
you'll not only get a Halloween-sized scare and a great read, you'll also be helping to support the work of this show, for which I thank you. Now, on to our interviews. This is another in our series of follow-ups to the February 14, 2014 radiation accident and atmospheric leak at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. To recap, WIP is this country's only permitted geological repository for permanent storage of nuclear waste from weapons manufacturing. It's a salt mine with deep underground storage and was predicted and planned to be effective and safe for at least 1,000 years. But on Valentine's Day of this year, only 15 years after it opened, there was a propulsive leak at WIP, some would call it an explosion, and a 55-gallon drum of waste from Los Alamos National, a.k.a. Nuclear Laboratory, released radiation. The ventilation system at WIP took over 30 minutes to kick in, and deadly radioisotopes of plutonium and americium escaped from the underground storage area via a ventilation shaft into the atmosphere. No bueno. Last week, at the October 16 Carlsbad, New Mexico town hall meeting on WIP, it was announced that the fan atop that very same ventilation shaft was going to be started up again on Monday, October 20th, as I record this yesterday. For perspective on why that restart was perhaps not the brightest decision ever made by the Department of Energy, I checked with Nuclear Hot Seat's reliable source on all things WIP, Don Hancock, the Executive Director of Southwest Information and Resource Service. Don, during the October 16 WIP Town Hall meeting, Nuclear Waste Partnership President Bob McQueen gave a presentation on the planned restart of WIP That was scheduled for Monday, October 20th, meaning yesterday as we were recording this. First of all, what did the restart as planned consist of, and did it take place yesterday? What was discussed at the town hall was a restarting of a particular fan on the surface that was in operation at the time of the release on February 14th and then was taken out of service so it could be cleaned and repaired, etc., and they wanted to restart that particular fan yesterday. I have no specific knowledge whether they did that, but I have no reason to believe that they did not do that. So there are three fans that basically work the same way in the filtration mode at WIP, where the air coming from the underground goes through filters, on the surface. The fans are on the surface. They pull the air from the underground through the filters and and then out into the environment. So obviously over time each of those three fans needs to get maintained, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the kind of thing they've been doing. And so the fan, the 860A fan that they were going to restart last evening was to restart it. So that in and of itself, repairing fans, fixing them, etc., is not controversial. That's normal maintenance that you have to do in any mine. The reason there was some concern and controversy about it is when this fan restarts, because there is contamination in the underground and in the exhaust shaft, what Nuclear Waste Partnership said is their analysis and their monitoring showed that the starting of that fan, because it's a different fan than the one that's been operating most recently, that could trigger some additional radiation coming up from the underground, and their analysis said that there would be a very small amount. They did not quantify at the town hall meeting and have not, as far as I know, otherwise what the small amount would be beyond what was said at the town hall meeting was less than 0.4 millirem is what any worker who they, if they breathed it in for eight hours, would get, which in their view is a very small dose. So as I say, as far as I know, they did restart the fan, but I don't, I haven't heard that for fact. Exactly what came out, what amount came out, we won't know until the actual laboratory analysis data is released, and that typically takes a few days. It strikes me as 
ridiculous that they would restart if there was any chance of radiation being released. What was the stated purpose behind doing the test now, and what is your thought about the decision to restart it? I mean, was it science? Was it appearances? Was it politics or something well, else? Well, because WIP is contaminated, it is very important that all the ventilation in the underground go through the filter system, and there are three fans that make that happen. From a health and safety standpoint, we want all three fans to be workable, and for the fans to be workable, they need to go through regular maintenance. That is a necessary function. From a legal and a regulatory standpoint, assuming their analysis was correct, which it may or may not have been, but the real proof is not whether their analysis of what would happen is correct, but what the actual data shows. And so that's why, from my standpoint, the important issue is that, in addition to DOE Nuclear Waste Partnership monitoring of what is released, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center should also be monitoring and publishing the data in terms of what actually does happen. Was there any additional monitoring taking place to check for any radiation release during the test? The general answer to that is yes, and the reason I say the general answer is there is regular, ongoing, continuing monitoring done by both CMERC and DOE Nuclear Waste Partnership. The additional thing that I want to have happen that the director of CMERC confirmed to me he is doing is to specifically change the sample, the filter, soon after this happens and then quickly do the laboratory analysis and publish the data so that we know what actually happened. So CMERC and Nuclear Waste Partnership are constantly monitoring, but right now when there is little or no radiation being detected, they collect and analyze the filter on a, about a weekly basis rather than on a daily basis, or when the release was happening in February, they were collecting on an eight-hour basis. So yes, CMERC is going to do a shorter term collection and laboratory analysis, so we'll see what's happening. Now, remember, if the filtration system is working as well as it's supposed to, even if there is radiation released in the underground, little or none of it is supposed to get out because it's supposedly mostly going to be captured by the filters. But again, we don't know what that looks like until we actually get the data. From a legal and regulatory standpoint, Nuclear Waste Partnership can do this without telling anybody in advance or without anybody having the ability to say, no, that you can't do it. So on the one hand, I think it's a good thing that they did actually talk about it in advance because they should have done that, but there's no legal or regulatory requirement that they do so. So I think it's a good thing that they did that. I think the thing that people need to understand is the WIP, despite DOE Nuclear Waste Partnership talking about it was a small release and you know nobody's hurt and all of that kind of thing they've been saying for the last eight months, that there are 22 workers who did have internal radiation contamination, or at least 22 that we know of, and that because the site is contaminated, there is constantly the possibility that additional contamination can be released, whether one considers it small amounts or not. So this is an ongoing problem and will be an ongoing problem until and unless the site is closed up so that the radiation, in fact, can be contained. What the Department of Energy is proposing are many activities that are very likely to release a lot more radioactivity than what probably was released by this filter. They plan to send workers into the underground in the contaminated areas and equipment into the contaminated areas. That will, by its nature, stir up more contamination, get it airborne, and have it come out. They ultimately propose in 2016 to actually start bringing more waste in and putting it in the contaminated areas in the underground, which, again, poses lots of risks and the likelihood of more 
radiation relief and all of those things putting the workers in the underground in the contaminated areas has the potential to expose the workers to a lot more radiation. So those are very hazardous things that from my standpoint the Department of Energy and Nuclear Waste Partnership has not justified as being safe or should be done and importantly none of those additional things that we're talking about that put workers more at risk and particularly the idea of reopening the facility to put waste in, those things would also have to be approved by somebody other than DOE and Nuclear Waste Partnership, namely the New Mexico Environment Department. Clarify one point for me. I believe in our past conversations we have talked about there's a need to replace the stacks or some structures yeah. Right. that were contaminated by radiation. Does this factor into the placement of the fans and the conduit that leads to the fans? Are those some of the structures that need to be replaced? Yes. What the Department of Energy is proposing in their recovery plan is the fans that we're talking about are at the top of the exhaust shaft. That's the shaft that goes from the surface 2,150 feet to the underground to the mine. And the reason it's called an exhaust shaft is that's where all of the air that's circulating through the underground comes up the shaft, through the filters, and then out into the environment. And it is the fans at the surface that pull the air through the underground, up the exhaust shaft, through the filters, and then out into the environment. And yes, the DOE proposal is to build a totally new exhaust shaft, because the current one is contaminated and will always be so. So their proposal is to build a fifth shaft, which would be a new exhaust shaft, and there would have to be new tunnels and a whole new ventilation system so that there would be different fans, not the fans that we're talking about yesterday or the fans that have been operating since February 14th, but a total new shaft, totally new fans, and a total new ventilation system going through the underground. All of that, of course, that I just mentioned could not be done, and DOE doesn't even say it would be done by March of 2016 when they want to reopen the facility to actually start handling waste in it. And that gets to the point that our recovery plan that they have wants to talk about a new ventilation system and a new exhaust shaft that would be clean, i.e. no radiation, but they also intend before any of that is done to reopen and to continue to operate the facility also as a dirty facility with these fans that we're talking about and the filtration system and the contaminated underground and the contaminated exhaust constantly going from now till who knows when. So people are correct to be concerned about the contamination in the underground and the exhaust shaft and what does or doesn't come up through the filtration system, but it's not just what happened yesterday or today. We're talking about this going on for years into the future if DOE's plans are approved and they're able to do what they're proposing. It's stunning that they would plan to have this restart before they have the clean new facilities in place, even if such a thing is possible. The short-sightedness of this is, quite frankly, stupefying. As I say, unfortunately, the Department of Energy, not just at WIP, but all their other facilities around the country, have a history of wanting to assure people that there are no problems, and then when it is obvious there are problems, to assure people that the problems are minimal and nobody's hurt, and if there is contamination, it's only a little bit of contamination, people shouldn't worry about it. And insofar as facilities need to be redone, new exhaust shaft, new ventilation system at WIP, new buildings at other sites, they are always going to happen faster and at less price, lower cost to the taxpayers than what actually happens. So uh, what is going on now at WIP is unfortunately the hundredth variation on the same theme that we've literally seen that many times over the decades out of the Department of Energy is they want to say that it was a small accident. It was very little contamination, so they'll be able to get WIP open by March of 2016, so everybody should think that everything is fine. But 
this so-called small accident is going to cost, their estimate is to fix this problem is going to cost $242 million plus, they don't even have good cost estimates, but under their estimate, upwards of a half a million dollars for the new ventilation and exhaust shaft. So they're saying, you know, the recovery at WIP is going to cost somewhere around $800 million. They totally leave out of that calculation another $185 million a year that they're spending on WIP. So if their overly optimistic schedule was correct, the actual cost would be a lot more than they're saying, but neither their schedule nor their cost are correct. So if WIP is going to be reopening and operating, it's going to take a lot longer than to March 2016, and it's going to cost a lot more than 242 or $800 million. It's going to cost way over a billion and probably into the billions, plural. And as you've kind of inferred, that doesn't even mean that the, that quote-unquote new both dirty and clean facility would actually work. So... Yes, there are serious discussions that people need to be having, not only in New Mexico, but with members of Congress, because it's ultimately Congress that has to decide whether to appropriate this extra amount of money. So there needs to be a much more serious conversation in New Mexico and around the country about whether any of this is a good use of money, is safe for the public, is safe for the workers. Don, thank you so much for yet another insightful update. Um, the problem in Carlsbad with WIP, and we will stay in touch with you for Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. Don Hancock, the Executive Director of Southwest Information and Resource Center. We'll have a food safety interview in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to keep us going and growing. If you appreciate the information, if you find that Nuclear Hot Seat makes you laugh, think, helps you understand the nuclear issues and not be so alone with your awareness, help us keep doing it. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red Donate button. Whatever you can do to help, I don't know that you'll understand exactly how much it is appreciated and needed. So for our second interview this week, it's an oldie but goodie, one from the vault. On July 26, 2011, only a little over four months after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster began, I interviewed John Solomon, Vice President of Purchasing for Eden Foods. The company specializes in macrobiotic foods that were mostly imported from Japan, and they were deeply impacted by the earthquake, tsunami, and resulting radiation release. Listen to how that company responded to the danger with responsibility, commitment, and follow-through immediately after the disaster began. This is from Nuclear Hot Seat Number 7, back when it and I were both a child. And as with all things that go back that far in our history, note that the sound quality is not what it is now, but the info is well worth the listen. John Solomon is Vice President and Director of Purchasing for Eden Foods. Several weeks ago when I was doing research for this program, I came across a copy of an email or a letter that was posted on April 13th on the Eden Foods site that was from the president of the company, Michael Potter, and he was talking about the concerns because Eden presents, um, uh, sells macrobiotic foods. Many of the foods are sourced in Japan. And he wanted to explain what was done for food safety. And it was such an extraordinary document that I began then to research Eden and to do what I could to get a speaker today. Eden is the oldest natural and organic food company in North America and the largest independent manufacturer of dry grocery organic foods. In 2009, the company was selected as the best food company in the world and the third best company overall by the Better World Shopping Guide. And this was because of Eden's outstanding record in social and environmental responsibility, and that's what we'll be talking about. John, thank you so much for being on the program today. Thank you for having me, Levy. Great. So when Fukushima happened, was there already any kind of a game plan in place at Eden's going, well, if our food supply gets contaminated, these are the steps we need to take? In an embarrassed way, I would say no. Mm -hmm. Not anything I would have ever considered, although 
Japan, uh, being the size of California, has an incredible amount of nuclear reactors. It just wasn't part of a contingency plan we had. But we put something together, the uh, Survivor's Guide to uh, Selling Japanese Food in 2011. Is that an official report? No, it's just something uh, we created that uh, just in a in our uh, in the purchasing department on uh, how to deal with this situation. How long did it take for Eden Foods to respond in a responsible way and realize you had to take some action on behalf of the products that you were providing and the people you were providing them to? It took a long time, Levy. The hardest thing to acquire was information first. And getting through all of the, the tragedy was, was uh, the, the first part. You know, a lot of the suppliers we were dealing with died. Um, and trying to acquire information from these suppliers and what was happening was second. And then trying to acquire information from uh, governmental agencies in, in North America was, was, uh, was number three. And none of the agencies was very forthcoming on what to do and how to do it. And that was when my department uh, realized we, we have to create this ourselves and we have to really address every, uh, every variable that could uh, affect our food. Canada was the first country that put forth an attestation form, which is, was a, a simple declaration form created by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for exporting food to their country, and they were uh, they created this form for Japanese food specifically. Well, excuse me, was this created before Fukushima, or it was in the wake of Fukushima? No, in reaction to the Fukushima tragedy. And so we had to fill out this form, and, and we still are. They were the first country to really react. And to export food, we had to fill out this form. It, was, uh, it had a lot of information. And we thought that was really great, but when we called some of the, the higher-ups in the agency to find out information, they were kind of mum because we needed to find a lab in the country to test for radionuclides. Mm -hmm. And they said, we don't know of anybody. And then they did find somebody, and they were, they were labs in Canada, but the labs would not accept the product coming into the country because it had not been tested yet, which was kind of funny. So they couldn't do the tests because you hadn't tested it. And so we, we called an incredible amount of agencies, a lot of labs in uh, the United States, and a lot of the labs were uh, not forthcoming. They didn't have a lot of information, and a lot of people didn't want to take responsibility because they were not used to this type of tragedy and uh, the gravity of the situation mm -hmm. is how I, how I sum it all up, uh, you know, after looking back at it. And finally, out of desperation, I called the California Department of Health. And I got a hold of a, a human being, and I said, I need your help to find a lab in the United States that can test for radionuclides. And uh, he was able to uh, put us in touch with a uh, company in I think it, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, called Eberline Services. And we started testing a vast majority of our Japanese foods with this company. It took about a month from the time the tragedy occurred, which was right around March 13th, March 11th was the exact date that it started. So once you had this process in place, how did you talk to people about what it is, the various pieces that you put in place, and how you test your foods before you will even allow them to be, to be offloaded and made available to the public? We have uh, two warehouses of Eden Foods, one in uh, California and one in uh, Clinton, Michigan. And I purchased two very sensitive radionuclide detectors that could test surface radionuclides on boxes. My main objective in this process was protecting the workers first. Mm -hmm. So we, we bought these radionuclide detectors to scan the outside of the containers when they arrive in. These are, these are uh, overseas uh, containers that are uh, loaded on boats and brought over to the United States and then loaded on trucks, so we're getting the tops of the containers, the sides of the containers, and once we deem those being safe, we open the uh, container, 
and we scan the uh, rear of the container, the middle of the container, and then we crawl up to the front of the container and we scan the sides and the boxes up there too. Mm. And if we feel that is uh, safe, we unload the product and scan uh, the boxes as they're being loaded into our warehouse. And then we test finished product. And what we'll do is we will pull product to send out to a third-party lab to have the food tested for radio supplies. And how long does the process take when you send the food out before you get a report back on, on the quality? It takes anywhere from two to seven days. And during that time, the containers, which you already scanned, and I presume that because you're still holding on to them, they don't have any radioactivity on them. Is that correct? That is correct. We put the product all on hold mm -hmm. if we deem it being safe for surface radionuclides. And to this date, we have not had an issue with surface radionuclides. That's terrific. What are you doing at the source to control the foods? Have any of them previously been sourced near Fukushima? And what are you doing to make certain that you're getting the cleanest possible product from Japan? We're not getting any product out of uh, the prefecture of Fukushima, but there are some uh, prefectures that are north, up in Hokkaido, and then uh, a little further west of Fukushima. We are testing every lot of that product that comes in. Every container that has that product from those prefectures are being tested. And in addition to that, we are moving the supply base of those prefectures further west away from the area mm -hmm. of Fukushima. So the goal in the next six months is to move all of the uh, supply base away from uh, the, uh, the area that was hit by the tsunami. This must be very expensive for the company. How are you handling the increased costs? We are uh, doing it out of, uh, well, to answer your question, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And, uh, we're not Thank you. To, yeah, we, we uh, you know, it's hard to keep your reputation. It's twice as hard to get it back. So what we're trying to do is uh, provide our customers the best quality food and uh, provide them sound mind and uh, confirmation that the product is safe. And right now we are just trying to, to get through. You know, we're still in the infancy of this. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not putting a price on this right now, though it is expensive. Mate. It is expensive. So is, is this something that you've uh, heard that other organic or even non-organic companies are doing, or have you been contacted by others in the food supply industry to learn your methodology so that they can copy it or do their own version of it? Nobody has contacted us. Really? And there was no model to, to follow or any model that we knew of from other companies or other organic companies. It was just something, you know, this was, you know, a reaction to the tragedy and what we felt was targeting every critical control point that we knew of that could potentially harm, you know, the food. And, you know, and our workers, too. That, that's, that's, that, 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 that's an important element, too. We want to keep the uh, product safe for our customers, but we also want to make sure that our workers are uh, safe, too. The level of responsibility that you show is so extraordinary. I, I can't commend you highly enough on behalf of your company for what it is that you are providing. So with this methodology that you have developed, that you piecemeal put together, you said that there was a report on it. Is this information you would be willing to make available to other food companies? Possibly. Possibly. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly open to protecting the uh, public. That I'm not uh, adverse to at all. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel a, a duty to that, too. What, if anything, has the FDA been doing in all of this? What I know right now is FDA has been coming in periodically when we receive containers, and they will put the container on hold. If, a, uh, if we receive a Japanese container, 
they will uh, send a notification that the product is on hold. And they will visit our warehouses and they will scan the product. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you the FDA did not seem as if they were prepared for this tragedy. Uh, one of the first visits out to our warehouse, uh, one of the FDA agents said, boy, your, uh, your radionuclide detector is a lot better than ours and I had trouble getting theirs started and, and figuring out how to work it. Oh, dear. I have used them in a long time. So I didn't feel that FDA was prepared. I didn't, I didn't want to uh, trust that the FDA was going to be watching out every, every step of the way, and that's how we have reacted. Well, the sense of corporate responsibility in this is, is is remarkable. You're a privately owned company, are you not? That is correct. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that, that has made a difference, um, not only in the fact that you responded, but because there was the will and there was the speed with which you responded. Because in the wake of the tragedy at Fukushima, to in one month put together a system that never existed before based on your own impetus, your own energies, and your willingness to pocket the costs yourself is extraordinary. And I have, in my research, found not a single other company in the country that has done anything close to what you have. And there are a few that I'm in touch with where um, I would like to be able to point them in your direction, if that would be all right. That would be all right. Terrific. Now, we've got uh, some callers on the line. I'm wondering if anyone has any questions for John Solomon, who is uh, Vice President and Director of Purchasing for Eden Foods. Uh, yeah, I've got one question. Um, I know this takes a lot of uh, time to do all the tests and all that. Now, how does that affect the food quality itself? The, the testing? No, no, I mean, with the delays, I mean, with all the testing you do, I mean, the, how to, the nutrient value, that's what I'm talking about. I don't see any degradation in, in nutrients waiting for the testing. You know, a lot of these foods are uh, fermented, they're dried, these are uh, tried and true um, processing uh, methods that have been used for hundreds if not thousands of years, and, you know, when the product arrives to eating foods, it's, it's waits about two to five days, and then uh, when it's cleared, it, we, we release it for sale. Thank you. You're welcome. So if we, the people, are interested in eating clean foods, um, the one company above all others that can be recommended is Eden Foods. John, I want to thank you for being on Nuclear Hot Seat today. I, I, I give a, it may sound quirky, but uh, I give a hero award completely on my own initiative. I call it the Jellyfish Award because a few weeks ago there were three nuclear reactors, two in Japan and, no, one in Japan and two in Scotland that were shut down because jellyfish swarms jammed the intake valve of the water and so the reactors had to be shut down because they couldn't take the water in, they were going to overheat. And I, my thinking was that if a bunch of spineless jellyfish can take such a decisive action against some of the nuclear threat that we face, others deserve to do the same. It's for heroes in the battle against nuclear devastation. And uh, I would like to award Eden Foods with a jellyfish award. Well, thank you very much. I gladly accept the award. Thank you very much. This has been uh, John Solomon, the Vice President and Director of Purchasing for Eden Foods, which has the best food safety post-Fukushima that of any company, uh, certainly in the United States, if not the planet. That was from Nuclear Hot Seat Number 7 from July 26 of 2011. We'll see if we can get in touch with John for a follow-up interview to find out what the company is doing now to guarantee the purity of its Japan-sourced products, maybe provide a model for what the rest of the food industry deserves to be doing. Activist shout-outs, Tri-Valley Cares in Northern California invites you, yes you, to create a video of two minutes or less about the impact of nuclear weapons on the environment in Livermore, California, home of the Lawrence Livermore Lab. Among the questions to be considered... What's at stake with continued nuclear weapons development in Livermore? How is the environment and public health affected? What does it mean to be a good neighbor in Livermore? 
Why is it important to you that the government clean up the contamination caused by nuclear weapons development around Livermore and beyond? First prize is $500, and you need to get your video of two minutes or less in by October 31st, Halloween, how appropriate. Now, the flyer says that it is a youth contest, but no age was specified that I could find. So maybe it's for the young at heart as well. So check it out yourself at TriValleyCares.org, and they spell it T-R-I-ValleyCares.org. More shout-outs. Many thanks for help this week with the show from Sheila Parks in Boston, Nausicaa Weeps in England, Myla Reason in Los Angeles for her hot tip about McFarland leaving the NRC, Crystal Coleman, who's offering government that is crystal clear down in Vista, California, Always to Sean Arclight for his help in posting Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook. And to Joni Ray for her invaluable assistance in creating the Nuclear Hot Seat YouTube channel and posting the shows there. I'm always on the lookout for people to help me with the show, from creating an Excel spreadsheet that lists all the episodes with links and content. You figure I'd have that by now, but I don't. To someone to help me figure out a new page in Japanese, and how to best present the many transcripts that are accumulating in German, Japanese, and now, thanks to listener David, don't know if you want your last name used here, so I'm not doing it, but David, who has been transcribing the shows into that rarest of all languages, English. So if you've got a thought of how you might want to help out, drop me an email at info at nuclearhotseat.com. Not Facebook, please. Use email. It's less likely to get lost. John Stewart, shout out. Hey, John! Now you've had a Karen Silkwood reference on the show. Crofts referencing the showers to the Ebola crisis. A stretch, but you're inching up on full frontal nudity stories, huh, John? Lots to choose from. Check out any nuclear hot seat to get the full haps. And know that this nuclear story will not go away, will not get old, and yes, together we can make it uproariously funny. So call me, Booby, call me. For today's final thought, Here's a quote I came across that provides some comfort for those of us who work so hard and so long within this movement against the juggernaut of nuclear insanity. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work but neither are you free to abandon it. And that quote comes from the Talmud. In closing, this has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October 21st, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, the US NRC, nears.org, dailysignal.com, nbcbayarea.com, washingtonpost.com, capecodonline.com, Yomiuri Shimbun, Japan Times, AFP, NHK World, GG Press, ITAR, ITAR TAS, the Russian News Agency, Arne Gunderson and Fairwinds Energy Education, Korean Atomic Energy Research Institute, PRI.org, Save the Children from Radiation.org, UK.complex.com, CityAM.com, Mirror.co.uk, those wild and wacky, we're not lying, we're just spitting the facts so hard it looks like Dorothy Cyclone, Spinmeisters at World Nuclear News, and the dashingly courageous Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Join us, friend us, tweet to John Stewart about us. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY-TV and is also available on airprogressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts, and you can also search our website for back episodes at nuclearhotseat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for nonprofit groups, blogs, and websites. You have my permission to reuse as long as proper attribution is provided. The San Onofre siren, which went silent as of last week, served as the original theme song, as it were, for Nuclear Hot Seat. And out of nostalgia, we're going to go out on that. This is Libby Halevi of Heart of Street Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, 